They'd spent hours making the costume. The two young boys, let's call them Johnny and Max, had always been on the creative side. Sometimes they got teased for it at school, but they didn't care. As long as they had each other, they could handle anything. They were best friends. Maybe one day they'd build great things together out of concrete and steel, but for now they worked with cardboard. Prior projects had included building a rocket out of cardboard in Johnny's backyard, like the kind that put a man on the moon. They'd also made a box for it like no other, more a box castle really, the kind that would stand for a hundred years, as long as it didn't rain, of course. But all of that felt like nothing compared to the tunnel monster. To these two young friends, it was a thing of beauty. A fully articulated cardboard monster costume meticulously cobbled together from boxes, masking tape, cardboard tubes for arms and legs, and a little twine to bring it all together. Frankenstein, Dracula, Freddy Krueger. Those silver screen phonies were nothing compared to the tunnel monster. They even cut out eye holes in the head and drew the scariest snarling mouth that they could write below. The making was over, and now they were ready to play. Johnny and Max took the costume down to one of their favorite places in town, the abandoned Brechter construction site. To many would seem like a strange and dangerous place for two young children to play, but for Johnny and Max, it was perfect. After all, they were the age where they had more imagination than sense. Max would be the one wearing the costume. Johnny helped him put it on piece by piece, using extra masking tape and twine where necessary to fasten all the pieces together. Little by little, Max became the tunnel monster. The transformation was complete, and it was finally time for the games to begin. Johnny ran, wielding a stick as a defensive weapon while Max gave chase. He could feel his own hot breath within the cardboard mask. It was oddly exhilarating. He gave a monstrous roar and charged after his friend, chasing him into the child-sized pipes of an unfinished water drainage system. It was more fun than anything they could have imagined. Max really got into his role. He lunged forwards, grabbing Johnny with his cardboard gauntlets and tried to drag him back into the tunnel, all while giving low, guttural growls. Johnny laughed and swatted at Max with his stick like a knight wielding a sword. They ran and crawled through the tunnels, the best of friends having the best of times, making the kind of memories that would last forever. And in that sense, they were right. Something they made that day would echo on forever but it wouldn't be something they would look back upon fondly. If they weren't so busy running through the tunnels, Max and Johnny might have noticed that something was amiss. They might have seen that, even though it was only 3 p.m. on a summer's day, the sky was beginning to darken. It may not have saved them, but it might have given them time to prepare for what was coming. Max was still chasing Johnny down a pipe, still fully in character as the tunnel monster, his arms extended to grab his fleeing friend while Johnny tripped. Max stopped to help him up, but something was wrong. When Max helped Johnny stand up, Johnny instinctually pushed him away, as though it wasn't actually his friend anymore. Max stumbled backwards in shock and horror. He could feel something changing beneath the cardboard. He suddenly was in pain. This terrible pain. Like he was being pulled apart and put back together. He started to scream. It was a horrible sound like nails on a chalkboard. Johnny had to hold his ears as the screaming got louder and louder, but Max couldn't stop. He was hurting too much to stop. Johnny was crying. He didn't know what was happening, only that his friend was in terrible pain and that there was seemingly nothing he could do to stop it. Even Max didn't know much more than that, but he thought it might have something to do with the suit. It felt like it was full of fire ants crawling and biting. It felt like his body was full of fire ants. He needed to take the suit off before it got any worse, but he couldn't. The suit wouldn't come off. He reached for the cardboard mask and tried to tug it off his head, but it wouldn't budge. He felt like he was tugging at the skin of his own face. He could suddenly feel everything that brushed against the cardboard, like it was connected to his nerve endings. The fear and the panic got worse and he kept screaming. It was a deafening, ear-splitting scream. He didn't know it, but anything electrical within a 200 meter radius was dying. TVs shut off, radios fizzled out, cars stopped running. Nobody who didn't work for the SCP Foundation would ever know why. It wasn't even 3.30 p.m., but the sky above looked black as midnight. Max was afraid, 
but all he could do was cling to the familiar. He lunged forwards and grabbed Johnny, pulling him into his trembling embrace. Is he still Max now? No, he doesn't think so anymore. He's something else entirely. As he held his friend, Max tried to dig his fingers into the mask and tear it off. They pierced through the cardboard, tearing holes into it. It was agonizing, but the mask stayed put. There was no escape. He closed his eyes just for a moment. Maybe it was a bad dream. Maybe he could make it disappear, but it didn't disappear. Only he did. Max was no more. There was only the tunnel monster. When Johnny woke up, he was disoriented and afraid. He was in complete darkness, but he could feel the old metal of a rusty railroad track beneath his feet. He didn't remember how he got there, and he didn't remember Max either. Not his face or even his name, but that's all right. Max didn't remember him either. When the terrified Johnny eventually found his way out of the old railway tunnel he'd somehow found himself in, he was rescued by emergency services and treated for dehydration. Because of the incredibly strange circumstances of his disappearance and reappearance over 4,000 kilometers away, it was only natural for the SCP Foundation to check in. But seeing as Johnny had no memory of where he was or who he was with prior to his mysterious teleportation, all they ever did was investigate the tunnel he'd appear in. Of course, they didn't find a thing. The case was closed shortly afterwards, written off as a kind of one-off spatial anomaly. Johnny was given amnestic treatment and reintegrated back into his normal life. He would never remember his encounter with the tunnel monster, but many would for decades and decades to come. There would be stories and scattered witness accounts from all kinds of people. Maintenance workers doing electrical repairs on subway tunnels, sewer workers cleaning up blockages in pipes, road workers fixing the asphalt in underpasses. The challenge with being an SCP Foundation field agent is often separating the genuine leads from the urban legends and spooky stories. But the details here were all too similar and specific. After all, it would be such a strange thing to make up. A moldy old pile of cardboard boxes getting up and running towards you. But stranger still, these incidents and encounters were occurring all over the United States, with the only commonalities being that all of them happened in tunnels or tunnel-like structures. The Foundation didn't know if they were dealing with one entity or many. Another peculiar factor they observed was that sometimes people who had encounters with the tunnel monster then themselves appear in tunnels extremely far away from the ones in which they first encountered it. As far as the Foundation was aware, besides transporting them vast distances, it never actually harmed any of its victims. But according to one Boston sewer worker, Gus Zagrelia, when the tunnel monster laid its cardboard hand on him, he felt the most profound sense of paranoia and dread. He described it as feeling like a thousand eyes in the dark, watching you die. Then he blinked and he woke up in an Arizona viaduct roughly six hours later. Everyone who reported a similar experience with the tunnel monster was detained, debriefed, and given amnestics by the Foundation. Eventually, they gathered enough data on prior encounters to accurately predict the next tunnel that the tunnel monster would manifest inside. A new mobile task force was formed to secure the creature, MTF New 4 also known as the Box Cutters. What they didn't expect was that when they finally engaged the beast was that it was no larger than a human child. It wasn't some huge tunnel-dwelling nightmare even after all these decades. The tunnel monster was little more than a frightened, lonely little boy. He growled, attempting and failing to come off as intimidating to these hardcore MTF members, and referred to himself as the Tunnel Monster. When they didn't react with fear and surprise like the others, he became subdued. They were able to peacefully apprehend him and take him back to Site-54 for testing and containment. Preliminary x-rays found that the cardboard costume hadn't just fused with the boy, it had completely transformed him. On the inside, he was filled with crude cardboard copies of all the major internal organs, with his blood vessels and nerve endings made out of colored pieces of string. They couldn't find any information on who the boy was, if he had ever been a boy at all and he was given the designation SCP-3663. In order to find out more, one of the leading researchers on the SCP-3663 case, Researcher Doyle, decided to conduct an interview with the Tunnel Monster, 
It had been the only interview with the creature to date, due to the emotional distress it caused the creature. When asked about its identity, it replied with only the tunnel monster. When asked why it attacked and teleported people to different locations, the creature replied, The tunnel monster captures people. That's me. I'm the tunnel monster. I capture people and take them into the tunnels where I live. In the tunnels. The pipes. I'm the tunnel monster. As the interview progressed, the tunnel monster became increasingly upset until it began weeping through its cardboard face, finally culminating with its crying out between sobs, Please, I don't want to play anymore. SCP-3663 only feels comfortable in tunnels, and will teleport away in distress if confined anywhere else. As such, its containment chamber is technically the maintenance tunnels underneath Site-54, where it seems to have made a home for itself. Occasionally, if it experiences fear, damage, or stress, it may de-manifest and appear in tunnels elsewhere. At that point, the box cutters are deployed to collect 3663 once again and bring him back to Site-54. So far, there has only been one major containment breach with SCP-3663, but it was a little more deadly than you might expect for a boy-sized creature made of cardboard. The tunnel monster escaped from the Site-54 tunnels and began wailing in pain. It went positively berserk, attacking surrounding staff and trashing parts of the facility. Anyone who heard the wails of the tunnel monster reported becoming extremely psychologically disturbed by them. During this four-hour rampage, the monster also tried multiple times to destroy itself with various implements, but was unsuccessful. After SCP-3663 was recontained, two deceased members of personnel were recovered from the scene. Autopsy showed the cause of death was a buildup of paper residue and wood pulp in all of their major blood vessels, as well as sinuses, ear tubes, and the majority of the digestive and respiratory systems. A number of other staff members were found to have been affected to a lesser degree, but are expected to make full recoveries. What triggered this explosive and deadly outburst? Not even the tunnel monster itself knew the answer to this question. But we do. At exactly the same time, a 79-year-old man passed away from natural causes after what seemed like a thoroughly unremarkable life. That man's name was Johnny. Now check out SCP-1762, where the dragons went, and SCP-3999, I am at the center of everything that happens to me, for more tragic and terrifying anomalies from SCP Explained.